online. And this is going to be a really fun panel with an experience to actually talk to some of the devs. Um, so we've got three of them here backstage. Uh, why don't you guys come on out? We have uh, Thomas Maroney, is the lead the ship artist for Star Trek Online. Yeah. 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 Jeremy Ray, who is the existence designer. Yeah. And Ryan Leather, who is the content designer. And uh, you definitely want to stick around and get this panel. We're going to have time for people to ask questions. We really want this to be like an interactive thing with you guys. Um, so we are going to be giving away t-shirts to the first five people who come up and ask a question. So definitely get in on that. Um, all right, so yeah, welcome guys. Um, thanks, for, thanks for doing this. This is going to be pretty cool. Um, so there's a few things we want to talk about today. And uh, first of all, you know, there's probably people in the audience that sort of having various levels of knowledge about the game. Um, so I kind of wanted to, to talk to each of you guys about uh, just kind of broad strokes. You know, what, what is Star Trek Online? Um, for someone who's either never played it or maybe has kind of a passing knowledge of it. Well, I'm curious how many players we have out there right now in the party. Most of you, yeah. Anybody never, never played the Star Trek Online? Great. So, uh, Star Trek Online is basically the only online RPG set within the Star Trek universe, uh, where you can play as a captain of your own ship, kind of as the star of your own Star Trek series, in a way. Uh, you play through, we have hundreds of hours of content missions, including uh, voice actors from all of the, the various series and everything. And it's, uh, it's your chance to, uh, I think our tagline is that you explore the Star Trek universe from and uh, currently, I believe we have more episodes in our game than any series of Star Trek up to now. Just, that just happened with the release of uh, The Curious Life. Our, our DS9 game expansion just came out this summer. I think we crossed that threshold then. So, I guess, is, is, it, is it fair to say that Star Trek Online is sort of like canon light? Um, yeah, so the only official hard canon is the TV shows and movies. Mm -hmm. um, everything else kind of falls under Apocrypha, um, but we work really closely with uh, CBS. They do make sure that like we're not ruining any of their IP. <laughs> so we don't want to. I mean, we really want to. We, we, we love the IP. So um, we are pretty much uh, like about as equal as the novels are. And I think uh, moving forward, uh, especially with the Age of Discovery, we'll be talking about a bit later. Um, we're about as close to the hard camera as the can get, so it's really cool. One of, one of the great things about the setting of Star Trek Online is that it's set uh, about 30 to 40 years after Nemesis and after Voyager in the Prime timeline, and um, it's the only real visual interactive media that takes place in that timeline, um, and we have over 40 Star Trek characters, we have actors who reprise their roles, um, so you can see what Kira is up to, what Oda's up to, you know, look into the future of these characters and see what they've become, what they're doing, and interact with them. Um, and it's, it was a decision that I think Cryptic made early on in the game that really just paid a lot of dividends, um, opened a lot of doors for us for storytelling purposes that tied a lot of those ends. And you know, just a kind of behind the scenes as well, like we're set 30 years after those shows, so, and in real life it's 30 years after most of those shows. Right, yeah. So we try to get in touch with the actors to come and play those roles. They're reprising it kind of in time with the uh, yeah. block step and actual temporal. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, I think like all of the um, all of the characters that from the show that are integrated in Star Trek Online is one of the things that makes it really unique in terms of just games in general, I think. There's just so many people reprising their roles, doing voice acting and voice work about them playing their characters and you get to interact with them. You can just walk up to them and talk to them. But um, let's also talk a bit about the player characters. So so Jeremy, I wanted to ask you, because part of the fun of an MMO is building your player and customizing him. Yeah. So you know, walk me through some of what you've done as a designer that makes the player feel like a Star Trek captain. Oh, yeah, I think this is one of the areas where Star Trek Online absolutely shines. Uh, you know, fulfilling the fantasy of you being the captain of your own ship and you leading your own Star Trek uh, adventure, uh, really relies heavily on you being able to customize so many elements of it so that it is yours. It's not, you're not just generic captain number 47. You're actually you, and you have your own personal ship that you can customize, your bridge crew that you can customize, uh, your own uniform, and aside from just the visuals as well, the gameplay 
offers a huge uh, a variety of choices in how you approach uh, combat or, or doing uh, oh, so many different activities in the game. Uh, there are, uh, I couldn't even begin to describe the number of different permutations of different uh, build types or, or uh, you know, weapon options or equipment options or, or species that you can play. It's like we have over 30 species in our game that you can play across the five different factions. And there's even more of that for your bridge officers. There's bridge officer species you can't actually be yourself as well. So it's, there are so many options. I like to uh, uh, say that it's a bit akin to like a card collecting game where you take bits and pieces of different types of mechanics and, and different uh, ways that you can play the game and kind of put them together to form your deck, which in this case is your ship, your crew, all their abilities and all the equipment attached to all of them. It's, it's hugely customizable. Uh, honestly, it can be probably a little overwhelming, but it's also it, it's an extremely rich experience. So kind of building on that, there's, there's kind of two parts to the gameplay of Star Trek Online, I mean, which is another thing that makes it unique. You have the space game, then you have the planet game, where you're on the surface as a person, and then you have yeah. you're in your ship. So uh, Thomas, you're the lead ship artist. So can, can, what can you tell me? If I'm, if I'm going to Star Trek Online, you know, what if I want to fly my favorite ship? Well, um, <laughs> you can. <laughs> <laughs> The, Woo, the, that's uh, the short answer. Right, yeah, the short answer is you can. I mean, There's uh, like a stupid number of ships. Yeah, there are over a number of ships. Um, uh, and looking at how different stats and stuff right now, there are 800 ships in the game. Just, Just drop the mic right, right now. Right. Yeah, the panel's over, there are 800 ships. Good night. Right, exactly. Um, but uh, that's across, uh, I guess we're up to five factions now between uh, Starfleet, TOS, Starfleet, Klingons, Romulans, and Dominion. Um, and then with Agents of uh, or a, excuse me, Age of Discovery coming up soon, you'll be able to have a Discovery starting experience as well. Um, so we've got a lot of ships across every iteration of Star Trek, um, including the, the Kelvin timeline, we have the Kelvin Constitution, we have ships inspired by the Narada, we've got um, you know, stuff from Next Generation, Voyager, uh, Klingon ships, Romulan ships, it's all in there. Um, so it's very exciting if you, if you want to fly a particular Star Trek Start the ship and start your online. You know, the chances are it's it's there. It's ready, really waiting for you. And and really, it speaks to a point about my passion as a ship artist is that the ships um, they're not just things. You know, they, the the Enterprise is a character. The Defiant is a character as much as the other like you know Captain Cisco or Captain Janeway or whatever. So uh, I feel that very strongly about players in Star Trek Online when they pick out their favorite ships and they customize them and they name, you can name your ships, um, you make a registry number, yeah, make the registry number, you can make them your own and, and it's part of your Star Trek adventure and it's a character that you create and uh, do it over and things like that, so it's a, it's a really big part of the game. And if you're thinking, oh, 800 ships, I mean, they've got me running out of ideas now, well, one great thing is we've been watching Discovery at work, and then after the battle of binary stars, we've all looked at Tom and we're like, so, uh, <laughs> guess you're making all of these now, huh? Thankfully, it's not just me, I'm a great team. Uh, we've got Hector Ortiz, a concept artist, and then we've got Ian Richards and uh, Mo Tenorina as two other ship artists on the game. They're not here this, this week, but um, they do fan fantastic work. So, um, just kind of still talking a little bit about the general stuff here before we dive into some specifics about the new stuff in the game. Uh, Brian, I had a question for you about the content of the game itself and some of the characters that we encounter. So my question from your perspective as sort of a behind-the-scenes guy, you know, how have you recreated the Star Trek universe in video game form? I know that's a huge question, but... <laughs> well, so, you know, one great thing about Star Trek uh, in in general is that there's a lot of like little holes here and there throughout the show. It's like, you know, there's only so much that they can put into an hour episode, especially when you put uh, commercials in there as well. So we have a lot of wiggle room to kind of fill those holes. Um, so we will often start with like a, a plot line that, um, you know, never got resolved, like what happened with the bottom line. Um, and then we can then create a story that continues that story that We've probably using the word story too many times. Um, and, and we start finding characters from the show that we can bring back. Um, so we were able to bring in like, you know, half the cast of uh, Voyager and, and then actually explore 
um, the tale of, of the Bodwar um, much more to completion. Um, and you know, the, the talent that we work with, the, the actual actors from the show, are amazing. Um, like, for the most part, it's as if they never took their costumes off. They just, they embody these characters. And I mean, it makes sense. After, after being the character for seven years and then coming to these conventions and everyone talking to them about their character, like, they like, eat uh, and breathe like these characters. And it's really awesome seeing the passion that they bring uh, when we're working with them. And so professional, too. Yeah. But so many of them are just like, like yep, ready to go. And right back to character. It's, like it's going to be. And for us, like, it's always down on some of these recording sessions. It's like, chills. Yeah. <laughs> I remember listening to, like, uh, uh, we got, like, an email, like, Jerry Ryan's recording right now. And so, like, a bunch of us went to the, uh, the door of the audio, uh, <laughs> the audio office and, like, stuck our ear next to the door and listening to her do some dialogue uh, for 7 and 9 was, was pretty exciting. You know, we just, Every time we bring somebody in, um, sometimes they actually come to our studio and we get to meet them. And they're really nice, very sweet. Um, and sometimes they record remotely, but we can still uh, hear them uh, through through closed doors and stuff. And it's just uh, it's always an experience. But Ryan's got to light up on the two of us in that regard. Some of his words actually get into their mouths. Right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, it's really cool because um, I think I've never been to one of the recording uh, sessions, and I mentioned that to Al, and Al was like, you know, come on in. We have. Uh, Andrew Robinson uh, doing some generic work, and uh, he's like, you know, don't say anything, you know, let them all do their work. So I'm sitting there on the couch, you know, biting my tongue, and uh, and Andrew starts reading the lines of, you know, you know come with me to to school, and I'm like, yes, yeah, I will go with you. But I'm like, can't say that. <laughs> don't think it. But it's it's just it's amazing. They are so good at what they do. That's awesome. That kind of leads me to like right into a question that I have for you guys, kind of talking about. Um, not only Star Trek Online in general, but I do want to dive into some of the new stuff in Star Trek Online, but Victory is Life, which is the Deep Space Nine um, edition, and then Age of Discovery, which was just recently announced, which is going to be all of the Discovery content. I think you're calling it ongoing saga. Yes. It's going to be multiple installments of Discovery stuff. Um, and talking about the actors and being able to see them do this work and how amazing that is, I'm curious, what were the actors' reactions you're saying that you're stepping right back into these roles, but is it almost just like a business relationship, or you know, are some of them, uh, did some of them react differently? Maybe like they're just excited to be back in the office. I mean, they're extremely professional, so um, you know, they'll come in and often they'll just be, you know, like, okay, I'm ready to do this. Of course, um, Jeffrey Combs decided to start his uh, his session by just talking as grunt, um, like just you know, just at the, yeah, at the his lunch for or just for fun of it and. Um, it starts there. I don't think we've ever had an actor that we brought in that was anything less than just a complete professional. Yeah. But there are also those that get so excited about it. Like Aaron Eisenberg and, and Chase Masterson joined us on stage on the panel uh, yesterday. And they get so into it. They're, they're back in the character and they love it. And Aaron even came and did a live stream with us where he just played through the episode where, where Nod was featured. Uh, and he brought his tea. <laughs> and he brought his tea, yeah. <laughs> Some of the parameters have, have uh, right, that, 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 that brings that up. One of my favorite stories about getting ready for Victor's life and trying to nail down who exactly was going to be in it. And obviously, he wanted all, all of Ferengi, and so that means Quark, too, right? As kind of the anchor of the whole uh, Ferengi crew. Um, but uh, Armin, uh, he wanted to be involved, but he didn't want to do it without his teeth. And so part of our contract was getting some even big new Ferengi teeth for yeah. him. Uh, we did it, and we got it, and it, it sounds great. It sounds great in the game, and adds so much to, to Victor's life. Yeah. It's incredible. I can imagine just like they can't speak the words with their mouth feels wrong. Right, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but it's also really cool because they, like, when we send them a script, all they have is a script. So um, then we get experiences where we get to bring them in, or like yes, or yesterday I got to show Ed Robinson um, footage of the game, like, actually, I went through a bit of it at our booth. And they finally can see the, the, like the final product, and it blows them away because you know we, we try so hard to get their mannerisms. Our uh, our animator uh, Weston Pierce like just completely nailed all of Garrett's mannerisms, and, and required creating a whole new set of like default stances. Yeah, and, uh, uh, animations just did you know, little head quirks. Yeah, it was, it was amazing. Uh, we showed uh, Andrew 
Thomas in that cutscene yesterday at, at our booth. And it was cool to see he had an emotional reaction to what was happening in the game. And like, uh, there's a moment where uh, Kira slaps Odo, uh, and then the, the, the camera cuts to Garrick, and Garrick has this big smile on his face. <laughs> and, and Andrew Robinson, like, Garrick enjoyed that. You know, and, uh, he said that a lot. It was, it was like, that, that felt so good to us as people who, who love the show and yeah. these characters so much that, that the, the person who portrayed Garrick identified with what we were doing with the character, and it felt authentic to him. I mean, Holy, holy cow, right? Like that, that's such an honor. Well, something I, like, I definitely wanted to bring up is just, um, especially talking about, you know, where we're going forward from here and the new content, integrating discovery with the game. Um, you know, a lot of Trekkies worry about new Star Trek stuff coming out because it's this beloved thing in our hearts, right? And we worry about who's got the, the keys to the franchise and making the decision. And like, these guys get it. Like, Star Trek Online, you can just see the passion that these guys have for the game. And from the people that I know from, the, like, the other parts of your team, that's universal. Um, so it's pretty amazing to, like, you know, I, I for one, I'm, I'm, I'm a pretty tough sell, but I thought I'm, like, very happy for these guys to be in charge of what's going on, like, like the discovery stuff. Um, we, 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 I mean, I, I personally had to kind of deal with that already with Victory's Life, because, you know, the Quartz Lucky 7 mission, was very different from everything that we've done. And as we all know, you know, in fandom, sometimes fans really hate change. Um, like, they just despise it. So, so I knew right from the bat that this was going to be either beloved or completely despised. There's a big risk. There's this, in the midst of this really uh, horrific war that's going on with this alien race that are just swarming across the, the Gamma Quadrant, we have essentially a heist. Like a, a, a comedy, comedy heist. Comedy heist in the middle of this arc. It's a big risk just from even a storytelling standpoint to try and to try and pull that off. But our fans responded very positively to it. I think in no small part thanks to the actors that the current. But also I think that in, in a part that is it's because you respected the DS9 property that DS9 in the middle of a horrible, horrible war would throw in these like silly Ferengi episodes yeah. and, and if anything that the weirdness of Force Lucky 7 really harkens to that. Yeah. So um, I like to think that you know we will do Discovery Justice, but at the same time, while we're doing Discovery Justice, we'll be doing fans justice as well. So I want to talk, talk uh, for just a couple of minutes about some of the, the details of Agent Discovery. So just give me like the, the rundown, you know, what's What's the story going to be, and how is that going to build into the canon from what we've seen on screen so far? Well, uh, Age of Discovery is the name of this, uh, as a multi-part release. Um, the first part of that will be coming out this fall. Um, uh, we're creating a new uh, starting experience, sort of like what we did with our original series era stuff a couple years ago when we were celebrating the 50th anniversary of Star Trek, um, where you'll create a, a uh, Starfleet cadet in the Discovery era who will be graduating from Starfleet Academy. We'll be teaming up with uh, Cadet Tilly, uh, played by Mary Wiseman. We're so excited to have her join us uh, in, as a you know a member of uh, Star Trek Online's cast. Um, and you know we don't want to get uh, too too into the weeds with details right now, but uh, it's going to take place um, after the Battle of Binary Stars, and so you're, we're going to be able to kind of fill in some of the gaps uh, of the Klingon War. You know, a lot you saw some of that in the show, but a lot of it was Discovery was out doing its own thing, or it was in the mirror universe. Well, all that was going on, and so we're going to be able to use uh, Jula as kind of a, an antagonist and portray some of the things that happened uh, there. Um, so Jula is a character from uh, one of the comics that, that uh, CBS has worked with another license to the IDW. IDW, yeah. The Light of uh, Chaos, I think, is the name of that part that they did. So if we got in touch with them and wanted in, uh, we're starting to talk about what stories we wanted to do mm -hmm. we could feature. Uh, they actually offered this up to us as a, as a character, <laughs> which is, is amazing to us to get something uh, back from them <laughs> uh, in this way. And so we've been working with them to, to kind of flesh out this character as the primary antagonist of uh, at least the starting experience in the, in the first few missions that we're doing. And uh, one really cool thing is that, yes, the Battle, the battle of Binary Stars happens in 2256. Now, for any of you Star Trek buffs, the year that James T. Kirk graduated from the Academy was 2057, so you will actually be his, his uh, senior, uh, which means you're all cooler than 
occur. <laughs> Um, so I do want to um, open up the questions pretty soon. So if you guys do have questions for us, we are giving away t-shirts. You know, for each five people who ask a question, so please yeah, step on up to the mic. Um, while you guys are, are getting up there, I do have some questions from our readers at TrendTV.com. So um, I'm going to start us off with this one, which is maybe my favorite. Uh, Duncan I know 11 asked, when was it? He shows up to our live streams. Oh yeah, I love Duncan. Hey Duncan, how's it going? Uh, shout out to Duncan. He wants. He asks, when will there be a viable P6 tardigrade? <laughs> <laughs> That's a shit question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, you I, don't I, talk I, about future content. Yeah, yeah. I don't know about a viable tardigrade, but um, he, uh, he's also sent a picture with the design. That yes, he's <laughs> 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 of course he did. <laughs> 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 um, yeah, we should have that for the first day. Yeah. But you know, if you're interested in tardigrades, we'll have them on the panel tomorrow. Just saying, that might be a thing that you might want to come to 10.30 here in this room. Uh, we'll be talking about Asian Discovery, which may or may not include a target. Yeah, so we're going to ask you to be a little tired about it, so they can have all the fun with the big announcements. <laughs> Definitely come, yeah, come back here at 10.30. Also, real quick announcement that these guys are giving away codes for bridge officers at their booth, so come on out in the vendor's room. So. Well, if we're doing announcements, there's also a week of death tonight at the IBAR, uh, I think at Mike. 8 o'clock. 8 o'clock. 8 o'clock, 8 o'clock at the IBAR. I told you You can ask all of your questions, <laughs> questions and you know, give them a few drinks and see if you can get out of the <laughs> Alright, my all right. My question is basically for Tom, sir. Is there any shift you really enjoyed working on more than any of the others recently? Since I know there's been a lot of new content. Yeah, um so uh, I am my my full title on SDO is the uh, lead artist for the ship and UI teams, and it's kind of a convoluted path how I became that. But, um, so, uh, in terms of actually getting to make shifts, I haven't gotten to do that quite as much as I would like lately, because I've been managing uh, UI artists, um, filling in gaps and things, uh, and also managing the shift team. Um, one of the things I'm really proud of that I didn't work on myself, but uh, kind of helped uh, make happen was the recent update to the Excelsior. Uh, recently, we completely revamped the model of the uh, USS Excelsior and the Enterprise V in the game. Uh, that was done by Tobias Richter. We contracted him to do that. He also did our new exterior DS9 model, uh, and it's a beautiful ship, and Tobias did a beautiful job, and I'm glad to finally have that up to par with some of our other, uh, our other newly redone ships. Also exciting because working with a, a really talented outsourcer like that really opens some doors to right. potential possibilities for us. Yeah, that won't be the last ship you see from Tobias. So. <coughs> Real quick, I want to throw in here another uh, online question. Uh, Pax Federatica asks, uh, will we finally get to meet Captain Killy, meaning like the action the mirror version, as well as Tilly? A lot of viewers, myself included, were disappointed that one, we never got to see Killy on the show, and two, she apparently died like a chump off camera. <laughs> 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 yeah. Discovery will correct one of these things. Well, I get nothing to say that when we were watching the show, we all fell in love with the idea of Captain Kelly. So um, I can't say for certain if uh, Captain Kelly will show up, but um, definitely stay tuned on Sunday to see what, uh, what Al and Mary have to say. Um, and nothing is off the table right now. Awesome. And we do now have a, a working relationship with Mary Wiseman, so maybe we can convince her to do it. <laughs> Just throwing out there. Hearing that uh, Mira Lita and Captain Killy time travel shenanigans. <laughs> uh, my question is, I I've been I was I played Star Trek Online with like the, I got in at the launch like kind of I guess eight years ago ish. Almost nine. Thank you. Um, and I, I've been I, I've been playing off and on. I'm mostly kind of the free to play at this point. Um, I was kind of curious though. In, when I do come back in and I'm seeing kind of all of this new content and these new systems that are being kind of put into place and, and kind of experiencing that and being a little bit overwhelmed with just the sheer amount of stuff that you guys have made over this, like, is there any type of balance that you're kind of hoping for the new player, like trying to balance of what is available and things like that? Because, I mean, a lot of the times I'll come in in the middle of something and I'll see the featured episode, which is awesome, but I want to maybe make sure that I get caught up back to that stuff. I just, I just kind of a, a yeah, new player experience or even returning old but player. 
Yeah, I get where you're coming from, absolutely. When, you, when a, an MMO gets to be this many years old, we understand that there's, there can be so much there for a new player. It can be absolutely overwhelming. Um, as we start to move forward, we've started to, to make the new player experience uh, a much larger focus for us. Uh, I don't know how much uh, how many details I'd like to go into just now because it's still a work in progress. But absolutely, that sort of stuff is, is on our radar, okay. certainly. And we are looking forward. I mean, uh, Agent Discovery is a great opportunity for us to bring in uh, new Trek fans that may have only come on board with the franchise as a result of Discovery. And if we're going to be marketing ourselves alongside of that, we know that we need to make the, the game as approachable as possible. And that's, that has always been one of our goals, is to make the game as approachable. Like, a, you can get the baseline of, of understanding it. Um, it'll take a lifetime to master everything that, that's in there, but uh, we hope that anybody can, can hop right in and have a good experience. And, and, and the better we can make that in the future. And I want to add to that that uh, game development, especially uh, service game development, like an actual multiplayer game, is, is always a struggle between finding the time to make something new and finding the time to make something old better. Um, and, you know, it, we really, uh, and especially based on team size and stuff, you're always trying to balance those two things. And sometimes you have to really focus on the new thing, right? And sometimes you do get time to go back and clean up old stuff. Um, so that's always, a, it's a, uh, I hesitate to use the word struggle, but in some ways it is. It's just prioritizing one of those things over the other. Um, and so, yeah, we, we know that uh, there are definitely areas of the game related to that that could be cleaned up and should be cleaned up. And we're hoping over the next uh, six months or so, as we do focus on uh, getting the discovery spun up, that we'll have opportunities to do more of that. But also, um, you know, with the, with the landing page that we just uh, released with Victory's Life, um, you're know, already trying to help people fit, like, who've potentially been away for a while figure out where they were um, so they can continue the game. And we've been also talking about improving like the in-game help system so that way if you don't know how to do something, there'll be a central location where you can actually look it up and, and get all the information you need. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I want to throw in a, a quick question as well because um, I, I actually know the answer to this one, but I just love the story so much. That's cheating. And I'm so <laughs> and, hey, I'm not the cheat. I'm not <laughs> uh, But yeah, this is such a great story. I want to make sure we talked about it while we're up here. Um, we were talking a bit about Victory's life and kind of how, uh, in the storytelling, you guys really try to pay attention to the, the small details. And we talked a bit about like Garrett and his movements and things like that. But there was a story about a particular restaurant and the promenade. Yeah. So. Um, <laughs> One really cool thing about the process of recreating uh, DS9 was that while um, Nick, uh, did we use he was taking pictures, he was taking picture, but now he's vanished. Um, One of our wonderful environment artists. He was doing a lot of research on uh, DS9 through all the seasons. And one thing that really came up was they kept using the same kind of section of promenade over and over and over again, and just like changing up the stalls uh, for whatever their needs were. Just um, so when he was trying to build the whole thing as a, as a loop, he had to kind of place uh, buildings or various stalls that would have been on the same location, but just spreading it out. Uh, one of which was the Klingon Deli. Uh, now, once the Klingon Deli was added, um, it was completely empty, and we were like, well, we got to put someone in there. So I started talking uh, to the character art team about, let's see if we can get like a, a, as close a representation of the uh, Klingon chef uh, put in there. So we got him. It was awesome. It looks great. And then we need to figure out what's he doing. So I spoke with Weston, our animator, and said, well, here's like the most iconic moment with the uh, Klingon chef. He is playing his like little accordion and he's just you know going to town, having a ball, and was like, I think if I get the uh, model, I can make this happen. And he he had to cheat a whole bunch of tricky things uh, because <laughs> rigging is complicated, um, and I'm not an, I'm not an artist, so I have no idea how to explain any of it. But he, he, the, like he and and uh, in Casaneda, our our uh, character artist made it, they made it happen, and, and now he, there he is, just dancing and having a wonderful time. And that just all came from, like, how can we take this little bit of extra uh, set dressing and make it that much better? And I'm really happy that it worked out the way it did. I just love those little details. <laughs> you got a question here? So you mentioned there's over 800 ships in the game, and we've seen over the years a lot of 
changing on ships, you know, especially with Tier 6, now Intel Command, and all these changes of the game, trying to keep it balanced for all the players. I'm curious, with the new content, you mentioned new play style for the new ships. Um, can you kind of tell us about like, a day in the life of how to plan what those ships are from like, a mechanical perspective? Like, you know, movement, speed, you know, attack, not, not necessarily like, cruisers and stuff, but just... Yeah. Okay, that's, that's mostly um, my team's work. Um, a lot of that is actually inspired by the art. Uh, it comes down from usually about the time that we've decided we're going to make a certain ship, we get at least a concept made at some point. And the sizes of the ship and the uh, cannon classifications even um, can usually factor into at least informing a lot of the early decisions. Like, is this an outfit? Is it an escort? Is it a destroyer? Where are we going to go with this particular ship? Um, and Sometimes just because of scheduling things, those are decisions that don't get made until even after Thomas's team is completely done with it. He already knows what the ship is, and I just go with his recommendations. Right. It's a bit of a snake eating his own tail, though, sometimes, because it's easier uh, when we have a cannon ship like the Crossfield or the Walker class or yeah. whatever. Uh, when we're sorry, taking something like the Herc and starting fleet from scratch, then that, that, I think, does start with you guys. Yeah, to figure out like, okay, well, what is what? Do, what do the hurt do? What's their shtick? Right, right. And then when we know that, then it's easier for us to figure out. Okay, well, if they need to behave like this, then they should look like that. Right. Um, I don't know if you guys have noticed, but in the Herc uh, ships art, a lot of the uh, pieces of it look like pieces of other Herc ships. And that's not just Thomas' team being lazy. That's on purpose. It helps. One, so. <laughs> one of the early uh, ideas of the Herc was that. It, we didn't end up going with this because it ended up being hard to play against. Uh, was when you destroy them, they become smaller ships, and then you have to destroy those, and those become smaller ships, and you have to keep going like that. Um, it's like Fantasia with the rooms. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> or those like Russian dolls. Yeah, Russian dolls. <laughs> so that's why you see a lot of the art elements in those in the bigger hurt ships that look like just uh, smaller ships smashed together with new elements added. I do want to say, uh, I really wish we could talk more about this, but we've been prototyping some really exciting new stuff that I think we'll see later this year that is completely new types of ships that play very differently from, mm -hmm. from anything we have before. Um, and it was really rough, fresh air for us to, to get that. Getting the opportunity to prototype new things for a game that's this long, far along, yes. is always exciting. Yeah. So I'm chopping a bit for you guys to see it because it is, uh, it's, it's pretty incredible. So. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. All right, I've got, um, I've got another question for you from print movie readers. So I'm realizing that all of our readers are like super sarcastic. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I'm just making the sarcastic ones, I don't know. Um, so Zeus Legion asks... Oh, God. That's our community manager recognize all these things. I think Kale already knows. Will, will any of the missions explain the Klingon Baldwin's mystery? I guess he's talking about a discovery. Um, is it just Q having fun? A result of genetic tampering or something more? We don't talk about upcoming content. Honestly, I don't even know what we know. Uh, uh, CBS knows. <laughs> it's, you know, it, no. <laughs> no. We just give the warp answer, right? It's right, we don't, we don't talk about it. <laughs> I think that's a fair answer. <laughs> Hi. Um, uh, you were talking about the balance between um, upgrading old content and generating new content. And with a new discovery thing, is there, is there going to be any luck in the corners since corners feature so heavily in discovery and the graphics are absolutely brilliant on the TV? Can we see some of that nice darkness coming to? Uh, again, I don't know if any details of, of Age of Discovery were ever released just yet, but I can say that that has been a subject of conversation. I don't know if it's going to be something that, can, that we end up having the time to deliver on. But we also love seeing Kronos in that way. So. I, would, I would say it's, it's pretty certainty, pretty much a certainty that if, if in the consequence of Age of Discovery and whatever missions we come out with, through the whole sequence of that release, how many ever months and you know into next year that happens, if you if we go to Kronos, we're gonna have to make it look like yeah, what you like, see on the show. Big right. excuse for us to do right. that. So uh, so. You know, whether or not we're planning to do that in the short term, we can't really say. Uh, but but if we do go there, it should look like what we saw in Discovery. Yeah. Any other questions? Are there ever going to be triples, like a triple problem? Well, uh, well, actually, you should talk about the triples. We, we do have triples in the game. Um, 
since launch, we've had uh, essentially triples you can pick up kind of as loot. As you're adventuring, uh, as you're picking up gear that drops off of enemies that you defeat occasionally, you'll find you'll be fortunate or unfortunate enough to find a triple <laughs> among their, their leftovers. And if you leave that triple unattended in your bag with any item of food, you will soon find you have two triples. And maybe four triples later on. Um, it, it can become a bit of a hassle in the, in the inventory of managing, but it's a, it's a fun little mini game. You can actually breed uh, better triples and petting them, gives you small buffs, uh, things like that. So it's, it's actually a, a small little, like, um, kind of an Easter egg that's been in the game since the beginning. We actually had a, uh, a Kelvin triple. I was about to mention that. Because that was, that was my idea, and I just went around to a bunch of different people, and it was not scheduled. Hey, can we do this? Yeah, hey, can we do this? Can we do this? And everybody got on board. And uh, so there's a Kelvin timeline triple, and if you pet it, like a lens flare. Lens flare. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, it is probably possible that we will have at least some form of discovery triple, but uh, we have not landed yet, so. Maybe they'll just shower you with fortune cookies or something. <laughs> <laughs> or at least fortune cookie wisdom. <laughs> great. Hello. How are you today? Hi, great. How are you? I have a question from a lot of people I've spoken to, which regards the loss of the exploration that we had in some of the earlier years, and we miss it. Is there any chance we're going to be seeing any of it coming back? So, the previous um, exploration? Yeah, so what you're referring to the Genesis system uh, was a lot of randomly generated maps and missions, uh, basically using a, a somewhat complicated like keyword system to try and put things together in a, in a manner that makes sense. The truth of the matter is 90% of the time it didn't make any sense. So uh, the, the fifth floor dynasty. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> go, go retrieve the artifacts right. for the board. Right. Oh, right. uh, well, I appreciate that. Well, there was a certain charm to it. Yeah, very much that. so. And I really did feel a little bit back into the series where it was more of discovery as much as being inside of people. Yeah, um, we uh, made the decision uh, for, for multiple reasons at one point to, to turn all that off, not the least of which was we were planning to move to console and all of those uh, randomly generated missions took up a huge amount of install space uh, that we couldn't really, uh, we didn't find tenable for the quality that was related to them. Um, but we have already undertaken some um, efforts to try and revitalize that or come up with a new for, uh, form of exploration that we can fit in the game. So far, those, uh, expo those explorations, those experimentations internally haven't borne any fruit, but it is something that we're very interested in getting. Exploration is central to the Star Trek experience. And while there's plenty of exploration in the game we had in the form of like, uh, building out your captain and your ship and, and exploring different ways to, to play the game, actually being able to just fly to a new planet and see what's there, you know, we'd all love to see that. Yes, yeah, it's really difficult to do in an online game space, but it is something we continually think about and would love to tackle. It is definitely something that, because we respect our fan base, we don't want to have us. Yeah. Okay. Well, you <laughs> just just <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Um, so let me first off say I absolutely love your game. I've been playing it since launch. Thank you. And. Um, one of the cool things about it is in Delta Rising, you got the quantum slipstream technology, which made your ship faster, which I just absolutely love. With Age of Discovery, will we possibly will we be seeing use of the more drive? Well, uh, so on the crossroad class ship that is in the game, it does have a form of this uh, that you can use for essentially transwarping around, uh, around the galaxy. I don't know that we would ever disseminate that wide, widely because of canon restrictions, like the Discovery and the uh, ill-fated Glenn, were the only ships that ever had access to this technology. So I don't think that even uh, within the universe, I don't know that it would make much sense for that to be disseminated widely. And I think CBS probably has pretty tech rates over who can have a uh, sport code. Yeah, we also don't know the actual fate of uh, Mycelium Network or anything. Right? The fact that it doesn't feature in any uh, of the other series could just be kind of a retcon, but it could be that something happens, and we don't even know that. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, we're also waiting for them to unbreak the cannon by introducing this poor guy from Discovery, right? right, right. So we're like, it's going to happen any time now. Right. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Um, so, since SDO is an MMO, the easy thing to do is, is lots of shooting and lots of blowing up bad guys. Um, how difficult is it or how challenging is it to bring the more optimistic view of Star Trek to a game like this? Um, and how do you how do you balance the mechanics of, of a video game with telling Star Trek stories that have 
more optimism and seek peace. So, um, yeah, you're, you're totally right. I mean, it's, it's um, as, as a game, there definitely is an expectation for a certain amount of, of combat, um, because that's why a lot of people play games. Um, but no, it, I guess part of Star Trek, we are always trying to come up with stories that embody uh, the, the hope and the morals of, of kind of uh, Gene Roddenberry's kind of you know, utopian views. Um, I, I mean, if you've, if you've played through Victory's uh, life, I mean, sure you're fighting Kirk, but at the end of the day, um, spoilers for the guys have gotten too far into it. Um, <laughs> You are trying to find a peaceful solution to solve the, the hurt uh, problem. So um, I think we, we are always trying, but like, because we are all fans of Star Trek, we are trying to kind of embody the ideals of the show. If you think about the episode Darmok, um, the you know there's this, at the very beginning of the episode there's this communication breakdown, and the Tamarians kidnap the card and send them to the planet surface, and he's there with the Tamarian captain, and they have. They have a peaceful motive. Like they, they, they want to foster understanding, and they're doing it the only way they know how. Um, but tensions continue to escalate and escalate with the Enterprise and Riker in command, and um, and shots are actually exchanged. I think command and shoot the shuttle and stuff like that. And and in writ large, that's sort of what we do with Star Trek stories, where uh, people, uh, the, the different factions and alien races and things, they have their agendas um, and they have. You know their motives for doing what they do, and it's sort of we have to have that comment in there, like you say, because it's in the mode. But the way we, we resolve all these stories is trying to find a way beneath all of that aggression and figure out, okay, what's the real problem here, and how how can we solve that in a way that is peaceful and, and optimistic? And I think uh, the Iconian order, how we resolve that, I think, was a great testament to kind of the Star Trek way of storytelling where we have this super powerful, super aggressive species and then we found out why they are that way and, and we do what we can to fix it. And then when we do that they understand that, oh, you know, that this was sort of, you know, this wasn't how things were supposed to go. Um, so we, we try our hardest to balance those two concerns. It is a type of for sure. And in, generally speaking, we try our best not to make missions that are just go to the system and blow up 20 on ships. Um, although in Discovery, maybe that'll fit. But <laughs> um, no, the combat, the, the conflict is usually just a backdrop to to reflect the the stakes right. of the actual story. I mean, we've probably actually had more like missions where you shoot to disable or stun than probably any other game. Right. Thank you. Thank you. It's funny. I think that was, that was an awesome question and really interesting answer you guys gave. It's funny because you know, we do giveaways of, of ships and different things on Trek Movie quite a bit, giving out codes for the game. And I always, when I, when I run into them, I always ask people to you know, tell me why you think like the Aquinas are awesome or whatever. I have them like tell me something. And there's always like two groups of people. There's one group of people who's there. Right? They always say, what would you use your teeth? Ship for and one one group will say I would use it to conquer all other people <laughs> in the entire galaxy and then there's the other people who say I would use it to to go and explore and help other people and help my friends in the game it's just funny there's like there's definitely these two camps that you can play in, in yeah. like two different ways if you want to question uh, first off love the game. Uh, I actually brought my console with me so I can play it here in my nap time. <laughs> 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 um, speaking strictly from a console point of view, uh, is there any way you can make the like the LB and the L trigger like customizable? I have seven different characters, and he basically maneuvers like in a different spot for all of them, and just with with all the choices, you know, all the different powers and uh, things that you can use, they're all in different spots for each character, and it's difficult. While I'm playing, and then I switch to another character, I'm playing with them, and I, I hit the wrong power, or I use the wrong ability. Are you talking about the radio engine? Yeah, with the uh, left button and the left trigger, like, he basically maneuvers in uh, seven characters. It's in a different location on each character, and it yeah. gets a little frustrating to use. Yeah. Is there anything you can do about that? Uh, we can look into it. Uh, I'm not sure how much of that is tied up in certain requirements we have for, for certain in terms of, like, commands and now just certain buttons, and it might not be a problem that we can 
be some of the effects, but yeah. you'd have to, to dig into it, but I will do that for you. Part of this might be kind of a, uh, a, an artifact of our, our transfer to console. There was so much game to try and fit on a tiny little yes. controller. Uh, that some choices may have been made there that uh, we can go back and revisit. Yeah, I understand that completely. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Hey guys. Hi, Terry. Good to see you. <laughs> um, my question is, I was uh, thrilled to be able to play in Gregory's life. As you know, I tend to play for story and not for battle. Yeah. And your stories were amazing. Thank you. Um, I know you had touched on it in an earlier question, but the Ferengi mission. Yep. It's really the first time I've seen you guys do session play, mm -hmm. where you take over another character. You're not playing yourself. Do you think that will open you, uh, open the storytelling into your character being able to take on other characters in the future? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, this is something that uh, we actually first experimented with this in an earlier uh, off-season episode called Renegades with Rep, where we play as a Zinkathy Renegade. Uh, and then for kind of, I hesitate to say perfect it, but we got closer to perfecting it with, uh, with my Nips and Ferengi. Um, we're at the point now with that technology that I think a lot of us are very excited about the, the possibilities that we can bring to the game. Definitely. Uh, playing as, potentially as, as celebrities like you did with, uh, uh, with Magnus and Frankie. Um, the, the hesitance, if there is any hesitance there, is that we don't want to take away the experience of you being you, right. uh, you being your captain in your Star Trek show. Uh, so if we, if we overdid it, uh, you know, and every episode was you becoming somebody else, you lose some of that. Yeah, so it's, it's definitely something that we want to use with care, but at the same time, we, we've also thought about things like, you know, oh, you're going to control a robot, so we can yeah. use session play into that, or, uh, I mean, we also did it a bit with uh, the uh, Binary Circuits uh, uh, PvEVP mission, yeah, where, where, it is. where you could actually uh, become a board and attack the other team, which yeah. was... <laughs> I think somewhat well taken. Yeah. Um, so no, we definitely are always looking for new ways to, to use the technologies that we kind of uh, come up with because you know it gets more bang for buck. Um, but yeah, we definitely want to see how we can tell better stories all the time. And if I can just get in trouble for a second, blue sky. I mean, one of the, one of the other ways we can use it that's not really the story is maybe maybe we can do a cool queue where like one person is four queue. And everybody else is their normal ships, and you often fight that mm -hmm. one. You know, asymmetrical uh, combat kind of oh, thing. Well, since we started working on the tech, I've had the thought of like uh, historical reenactments where yeah. you can play as Kirk's Enterprise or right. some sort of situation. So those are all possibilities. Yeah, right. possibilities. <laughs> we haven't really discussed or investigated them very deeply at all. Like, uh, no promises. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah, it's I, a really cool way. I understand. I just yeah. thought it would open up a lot of doors for uh, unique storytelling. Definitely. Yeah, I, mean, I think we've all talked about at some point, like, to various levels of, of joking around of at some point being, being able to play a space like game. Um, <laughs> cool, thanks much. Thank you. I, I kind of want to pick up on that, uh, the idea of the, the way that you tell stories for a bit. And that's, to me, you know, very much the heart of what Star Trek is. It's all about the stories that they're telling, and it's a lot about Star Trek Online as well, but all these stories you can interact and be a part of. Um, and we were talking a bit um, off stage about uh, uh, Victory's life and how what Deep Space Nine did for Star Trek was that it, it added a lot of things to the way that Star Trek told the stories. And I wanted to ask you guys to talk a bit about uh, how that type of storytelling, how those influences from the show have affected the way that you can tell the stories, uh, particularly like in Victory's life, um, that is online. Um, I mean, I think that's probably, there's probably like two, two parts to that. Um, you know, DS9 is when we really started moving away from episodic content into serialized content, and I think that that's always been a very strong, but I mean, that didn't influence storytelling and television and games in general. But I think since the beginning of Star Trek Online, we've had a, a more serialized story. Story, yeah, because of that. Yeah. Um, and so, I, so that definitely has influenced us. But I think um, the thing about about DS9 is that it's you know it's it's a, it's a lot more about the people and the relationships between the people, um, and I think you know we try to, to bring as much of that to our game as possible because you know again we love these characters um, you know we we couldn't have told it, you know this story of of Kira and Odo you know and their tumultuous relationship and how it all comes together um, without 
kind of that emphasis on the characters that, that DS9 gave us. So, um, you know, we, I, I think it's really helped us, um, you know, create a nice solid story for all, all the different uh, characters and, and your place in all, all of that. DS9 in particular also kind of brought a grayness to the Star Trek franchise that hadn't really been explored a lot. Uh, TNG touched on it a, a little bit um, on some other episodes, but there was, like, by the family like or uh, Rocks and Shoals, there were uh, quite a few episodes of Deep Space Nine where you as a viewer might have felt a little uncomfortable with the subject matter about being asked to, to second guess your own moral and how would I behave in this situation? Did they do the right thing? Maybe they didn't, but can I still respect them for that? All those sort of uh, questions. It was a very strong part of Deep Space Nine's storytelling overall. And we tried to do that uh, a bit of that in Victory as Life as well. Odo makes some really bad decisions for very good reasons during this uh, during this whole storyline. And Garrett's the only one who understands. Yeah. Well, if I can piggyback on that a bit, I mean, the other thing that DS9 really understood that I actually think modern TV doesn't understand nearly as well is that good storytelling, kind of like good cooking, is about contrasts, right? Contrasting flavors, right? And so you have those gray moments, you have the despair, you have the, oh God, how do I need to get out of this? But then you have to take me out to the hospital. Yeah. You know, you have these joyful, you have uh, the Magnus and Frank. Right, the Magnus and Frank, you have from Dax's wedding, right? And so, um, so in a microcosm, we did that with Victory's Life too, where we have we have the Herc invasion, and it's bleak, and no, uh, no, it's terrifying. But then we have the uh, Quartz Level 7, where um, it's a, just a fun heist episode, and there's some hilarious moments in it. Um, so it's just, it's, it's balancing the ups and downs, and, uh, and DS9 was really, really good about that. Also, I'll say, just uh, bouncing off of uh, Jeremy's comments about uh, Big Moral and Gray, um, I think we also were able to use that influence for our Rank of Regret uh, mission because we got a lot of feedback from people about how uncomfortable they felt just mowing down civilians as a, uh, you know, second of the uh, Renegade. And like, that was the point. Like, uh, it's, you're not supposed to feel like a hero doing that. The whole story was, why did she do that? Yeah. Did she, 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 she left because she realized she was going too dark on the, on the grayscale. <laughs> um, and, and, and I feel that that actually came across, um, and, and that's why, um, you know, the, the, all that could only happen because of the inspiration of shows like this time. Yeah. Well, I have a, another question from a, one of our Trek movie readers. Uh, this is from Rachel Amber Bloom who was asking also about storytelling, and she says, do you usually write a story and then try to get those voice actors? Or do you write a story with voice actors that you have in mind? Um, so it's kind of a bit of both. Um, we try to figure out the macro story um, definitely before we figured out where voice acting and cast will be. Um, and we use that macro story to try and help us figure out what actor we really want to try and get into the uh, in, into that story and who would fit best. Um, but once we kind of have that idea, we start, we, we actually have to start working on the content um, with the assumption that we're going to get that actor, but before we've actually successfully, like, got the contract. And then we just kind of cross our fingers and hope that they'll say yes. <laughs> we do have several, like, backup plans and contingent valves and stuff yeah. where it's like, okay, well, if they don't sign, then, then maybe it can be this character, you know, and, and like two or three layers of that, depending on the right. story. Right, to put it into context, of, uh, like Brian's saying about the macro story, the story of Victory Life was always going to be focused on the Jem'Hadar, and it was always going to be about the Herc invasion of the Gamma Quadrant and how the Dominion has to deal with all of that. And all of that whole story could technically have been told without a single celebrity voice actor. I don't think it would have been nearly as impactful, obviously, but uh, we had enough ideas there that if we couldn't get for certain actors, other choices could be made to tell the same stories. Or very similar, very Except for Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, we have a few more minutes, you? and so I wanted to see if you guys maybe wanted to talk about either the thing that you're, you've been most excited to work on lately, or maybe like the thing you've been most frustrated with, and just keeping you up at night. <laughs> oh, that we can talk about? That you can talk about. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I, I can say, I mean, one of the, the interesting things about Star Trek Online is that it's putting all of these different, um, all 
these different pieces of Star Trek into the same context, which has weird side effects. Um, when you look at the, um, for example, the, the Enterprise in, shows up at the very end of season one of Discovery. Um, the ships in Discovery are much larger than they were in the original series, including the Enterprise. They scaled it up by maybe 150 percent at least. Um, and so, if we were ever, this is not an official announcement, but if we were ever to put that version of the Enterprise in the game, we have to figure out, okay, what size is it? Is it the size you saw on the show? Does it match the size of the Enterprise, you know, the Constitution class we already have in the game? So, in other words, that's also considering like, whether or not pieces are going to change. Right, so there are all these huge uh, questions that come up when, when uh, approaching new content like this that, that we have, we just, we have to figure out, it sort of reminds me of um, the, uh, Kenner, when Kenner was making Star Wars toys uh, in the early uh, 80s, they had to figure out how does a stormtrooper get into an AT-AT, even though the AT-AT is, you know, 50 feet tall or whatever, and so just, just weird things like that. It's like, okay, it looks cool on the screen, but now how do we make it work? <laughs> That's actually practical. Yeah, that's funny that you bring up the ship size thing. That's something that, you know, one, one of the things that people often complain about in terms of like changing a canon, it seems like the ships have just gotten bigger and bigger. As in, like, the that's also true in Star Trek Online. One thing I want to know how do you know how big the ship is? Like, you see the Enterprise on, you know, when, when it came in, in, in Discovery, like, how do you know that it's Whatever, 100%. Yeah, I, we're we're lucky that we get we just get those numbers right from CBS now. Okay. I mean, in in the past, um, it's it's one of those things that's very different from making uh, content based on a 30 or 50 year old TV show where you have 30 years of people arguing about that stuff online, and there's generally a fan consensus about okay, the Enterprise is almost a thousand feet long, like the the Constitution class Enterprise. Um, and then, and then when you had people like Mike Mukuda, the director of Sternbach, working on the Next Generation, they cared about that stuff. So they knew exactly how long the Enterprise D was. It wasn't just like uh, about this big. Yeah, about this big, right? And so, so those numbers kind of got codified in like the TNG tech manual and all that stuff, right? And then the people working in Discovery now, um, John Eves is a you know actually he'll be here today or tomorrow talking about all his work on Discovery and how the time was. But he's a huge Star Trek fan, and he knows how important that stuff is. And so those guys have a really clear idea of how big their ships are. And they actually, we get that direct from them, those numbers. Um, and Eagle Moss, they also want to know how big the ships are. So when they're making stuff now for Star Trek, they understand the scale of the fans, and they do. Um, size does matter. Size does matter. <laughs> so, so we are able to just get that through. Like they, they make a declaration, OK, Discovery is this long, the Enterprise is this long, and we know. Okay, that's how long it's made. Have you had to guess that any of the ships in the recent past? Um, the, the, uh, we, we fudged things a little bit. I think we made the Monkey Raider a little bigger than it actually is, so that we, or uh, we, we fudge it in the sense of, like, if there is dispute uh, online for fans, whether or not, like, oh, it's this big or that big, then I just pick the number I like. Yeah, I'll be kind of big space now. Right, it depends right. on who you ask. Right. Well, I remember people uh, telling the environment team telling me that um, like on different episodes of DS9, like you, you have like, the Defiant and DS9 next to each other as like relative scale, and that's relative scale is completely different. Right. right. Yeah. There's a, there, there are shots in the Defiant where DS9 looks very very small, and then there are shots of the like the Enterprise D is docked at the upper pylon, and the DS9 looks huge uh, comparatively because the Defiant is a much smaller ship than. Enterprise, but it also has its own scale problems. So really, I guess the moral story of scale issues are not a new problem for Star Trek. It will probably persist into the distant future. <laughs> we just have a couple minutes left here on stage, so I want to get into your question. Wouldn't it be interesting to see in the Age of Discovery with the uh, Empress Georgia's ship show up the black possible? You guys get to that way. Yeah. But so I have ship scales. <laughs> I actually, I actually just wanted to tell you guys, um, DS9 is my favorite show for Star Trek, and I think you guys are hit on the dot with Victory's Life. I actually really felt like I was back in the show, uh, even though as many times as I've watched it, it was like, this is really cool, it's, a, it's an awesome continuation of the show. Um, so I just want to give you guys kudos for that, because it was, it was fantastic to play as a Joan Arc, it was fantastic to actually interact with these characters, I really actually felt they were the same ones from, from the show, especially 
like how Kira's storyline transitioned through the through the expansion. Um, and my only question is, how do I get a shirt like that? These? Yeah. Oh, no, no, these, these were just oh. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. It's, it's great to hear that kind of thing. We also actually heard some of that from the actors that we brought in. Yeah, they want our shirts too. No, no, no. no. <laughs> <laughs> about, about this really feeling like a Deep Space Nine. I think one of them even said, like, this is probably closest to a Deep Space Nine movie we're ever going to get. Yeah, Jay said that. Yeah, it's okay. And, and just that it felt like coming home, like it was another. Uh, another uh, season on the series and all like that sort of stuff. It was great to hear that directly from the ones that, that played these roles for so long. Do, do we have time for a little bit more? Yeah, we have, we have like two more minutes. Nice. Okay, so I did want to ask, because we, I, I kind of have that uh, what keeps you awake at night question when we scale stuff, but uh, can we go down the line and ask them what, like, what you're most proud of for Victory's Life? For Victory's Life? Yeah. Uh, I'm really proud of the way that the wingman uh, ship mechanic came together for the Dominion. Early on in the playtesting of the Dominion content, we just kind of randomly, I think, decided that during this mission, you are part of a strike team. There's two other ships that are flying with you and helping you out with your um, with your objective. And everybody who played through it was like, I really like this. I love these ships following me along. I would like to have them permanently, please. <laughs> and it was a great part to pull together. But in the end, we were able to come up with a really cool ship mechanic that's unique to the Jet Power ships where you are always part of the strike team. You have two wingmen that follow you around and follow your orders and do certain uh, uh, maneuvers on your command. It, it's really paid off. It's a really great experience. Actually, and they don't tell you to do a barrel roll every five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> I saw that thing on uh, Stonebill's, uh, I think it was this morning or yesterday, it was like, here's how you can make a ship with 58 pets. And it was, uh, <laughs> uh, it was a Gemini carrier. Yeah, you know, of course. And the strike, the, the uh, attack craft and all that stuff. So yeah. that, that was really fun. Uh, I mean, definitely for me, the 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 crowning achievement was was working on uh, Force of the Seven. It was it was a, a lot of work, um, a lot of, of late nights just trying to make it all work, um, and I think it all came together at the end. And, and the, it, it, there were a few things that came pretty hot. I think we got the music for that episode like two days before we launched. It was. Yeah. It was, it was, it was hard to be able to license sabotage. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, I mean, it, it was something that, you know, you know, I worked on, Weston worked on, uh, I, I think at some point all of our environment artists were working on it. Um, you know, we had a lot of character work, a lot of systems work. Um, it was just intense. It was easily the most complicated episode that we've yeah. ever done in Star Trek Online in terms of just Man hours and disciplines involved, which is why we're definitely not using it to set the bar because <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's a little unachievable. The last for things that keep me up at, at night, um, I, I'm currently working on the on the nuclear experience, uh, you know, for for Age of Discovery, and you know, this is my first time working kind of on a on a, on a nuclear experience and. <laughs> for us apart. Yeah, it is. It is a lot of work. Um, I think that they, all the things that they can, the questions that a new player might yeah. have as they're playing the game from very first time. You know, and as, as someone asked earlier, you know, how do we make it easier for, for people to kind of get like, to understand what's going on? You know, we really want to make sure that we're hitting all those points, and, and the players aren't going to get lost, and that uh, you know they. It's not going to just turn into a reason to quit the game. So it's, it's and in the midst of all that, also selling the discovery fantasy. <laughs> So it's, you know, that, that I mean, is, 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 it's a really interesting and exciting challenge. Well, I think that's a pretty good note to end on. Um, glad we got a little bit of extra time to make sure we got to everyone's questions. Um, let's thank you guys again. Thank you to all of you for coming out, because 
I know I'm not really that interesting of a person, so thank you. Ryan, you're the most interesting of all. And Jack Murphy! Yeah, I can Jack Murphy. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 Yeah.